So one of the most common questions I get from a client during a call or a lot of times even through email is what do I do when I'm just in no contact? Maybe I just started, maybe I've been doing it for a while, but suddenly it just got harder for some reason. Well, one of the things I like to point out because it's not the kind of thing that they teach you in school. So instinctively, a lot of people don't know this is that not everybody feels things to the same level. Not everybody feels pain, hurt, love, excitement, drive, whatever it is. So some people that are in heartbreak, it's a surprise to them just how severe it is. The strange thing is a lot of my clients are, are highly successful people. It really varies. It could be somebody that's in high school really dealing with a painful breakup, which is real. I know we kind of think of somebody as young and it's hard to take them seriously, but there are a lot of people that are young that are in overwhelming pain after a heartbreak. So you have to respect that. But it could range all the way to somebody that's in their 80s that's ultra successful. Some of my favorite clients are people that you wouldn't even expect to be clients. They might run a multi-million dollar law firm. They might be a, a really successful actor, director. I've talked to people that are doctors, lawyers, I mean judges. People that really in every measurable metric in life, they're dominant. They're successful. They don't look like the kind of people or seem like the kind of people that would ever really struggle with breakups. My point is one of the things that gets missed a lot of times are that sometimes the most exceptional talented, high value people. And I know everybody has value, but what I mean is the kind of person that you look at and think, well, somebody that good looking, somebody that attractive, somebody that charismatic with that kind of personality or that level of success. I mean, they have millions in the bank. They're driving a Lamborghini and they live in a mansion. What kind of heartbreak and love issues could they be having? Well, sometimes the more exceptional and impressive person is actually in a lot more pain than you realize. That's because that same intensity that allows you to become successful, that allows you to become exceptional, is actually tormenting you. And what I want to talk about in this video are kind of those cases, and there's different names, there's different versions. Like a lot of times people don't understand that limerence itself, which is great and euphoric when you're falling in love, will actually kind of come back and haunt you after a really painful breakup, especially again, if you're wired with that higher level of intensity. One thing that they don't teach you in school, is that we kind of associate now intelligence with like uh, Dr. Spock or Sheldon from Big Bang Theory or somebody that struggles with like Asperger's gifted and might not be completely socially fluid. We kind of think of that person as the definition of genius. The truth is sometimes IQ is actually associated with high sensitivity, high intensity, and they feel things to a much deeper level than people realize. And because they can be successful and sometimes come across as arrogant or ultra focused on attaining success, People don't think that they're actually hurting as much as they are. In other words, what you might not realize is that the same thing that makes you a success in life, that unusual drive and intensity is going to come back and start to torment you when you're in the middle of a breakup. But there are different levels to heartbreak, just like there's different levels to everything else. Look, not everybody feels tempered to the same level. Not everybody feels passion to the same level. Not everybody feels excitement. Like we're wired in different ways. That doesn't mean we don't feel it on the inside, but we express it in different ways. We also feel it to different levels. Some people take a heartbreak and they'll, they might spend their whole lives thinking, yeah, I don't like it when a relationship comes to an end, but I've always been able to move on. Other times people can be afraid of their own emotions and they're almost afraid to get in a relationship because they know if it goes south, they're going to go into this pit of torment that they don't know how to dig out of. So they actually start to avoid relationships. That's not a sign of weakness. It's just that we're not all wired in the same way. We're all humans, but we're not all wired in the same manner. So we don't experience things to the same level, but every heartbreak hurts. But I like to kind of call, if you're going through a normal heartbreak, that's really painful, but I kind of call it the dark limerence. Because what some people don't realize, and I kind of covered this in the last video when I explained how to get over it, a certain technique to help you get over a painful breakup, but think of a heartbreak as limerence in reverse, or what I call dark limerence. What I mean by that is when you're falling in love, you have oxytocin, you have serotonin, you have dopamine, you have adrenaline. It's like God's little cocktail that he wired our bodies to generate when we're falling in love. It's kind of a bonding thing. It's a bonding agent. It helps us to have sex, not only have sex, but to stay committed so that we can actually raise children so that now you're kind of helping everything populate, right? So it's part of how nature works. It's how God wired us. At the same time, when somebody goes through a heartbreak, that same cocktail that made you fail, fall in love, it's like time for round two, except this time we're going to add a depressant in there. And what's happening is the same hormones, the same way of thinking, the same uh, mesmerized state of mind that made you see them as perfect and wonderful and idealized. You couldn't imagine your life without them. And you just felt euphoric, imagining that the two of you were going to be together forever. You were going to get your happily ever after. Well, now this is the dark version of that. Now those same hormones come rushing in. But now it's like they, they kind of taint your vision and you think you're looking at reality. But the truth is, when you look back at the past, all of a sudden the past is even more perfect. 
it's more wonderful. It's more beautiful. They're even more precious. And even their flaws are starting to kind of gloss over. Yeah, I know they burned my house down, but the truth is it was my fault. I mean, she asked me to get her a large Coke, and I got her a medium Coke Zero. So, And she had told me before, so I think she burned my house down as a way to really test my love. She's never really kind of, you know, experienced true love and devotion the way I feel it for her, and I think it scared her. I think that's why she slapped my mom. I caused him to cheat on me. I caused him to steal my car. It was my fault. That's why she took a dump in the refrigerator. I wasn't listening when she said that she didn't feel important. In other words, your mind will come up with reasons to protect how you see them. Now, like I covered in the last video, the more you allow yourself to see them as perfect, the further away they get. It's really hard to come across as attractive and charismatic and project the strength that you need to trigger a re-examination on their part if you're consistently in a state of worship because worship isn't attractive. We all think we'd like to be worshipped, but it's really not as enjoyable as we think it's going to be when we get it. Like one comedian says, I thought I wanted somebody who loved me completely until I found it, and then I found out it was annoying. It's like being with a puppy that can text you. So if you're the puppy that keeps texting, it's really hard to re-trigger that sense of attraction and sense of loss that leads them to coming back. So that's in a previous video where I talk about how to deal with that dark limerent. But, but just for the sake of catching up quickly in this video, when they break up with you or you find out they cheated on you and there's a break in that sense of, uh, that sense of value, that sense of being wanted, we're wired at a primal level. When somebody has given us a consistent state of value, a consistent state, a, a consistent sense of meaning and importance, when it's gone, we're made up more of ego and emotion than we want to admit. And suddenly that sense of value that we had from somebody that played a relevant role in our life is gone. It just triggers this examination. What's wrong with me? Why, why did they cheat on me? Why don't they want me anymore? What did I do? What did I break? What's wrong with me? I've talked to a lot of clients that are really kind of successful, strong, even dominant people that tell me, you know, the funny thing is, Coach Kane, I always thought if they cheated on me, I, it'd be kind of a relief because I've always kind of thought I could do better. I always knew that if they cheated on me, I wouldn't want them back. But then when they broke up with me, or when I found out they were being unfaithful, the truth is I can't stop thinking about them. They're in my mind. I, I don't know how to get it. I don't know how to change the channel. I don't know how to get over them. And I'd do anything just to have one more chance. And now that I look back, maybe they cheated on me because I thought I was in the power position. Maybe I did take them for granted. All I know is now I want them back. It's a very common thing. We're not nearly as logical as we think we are. And when that dark limerence hits you, the same hormones, the same cocktail that God made to have you fall in love in the first place is now going to be kicked into high gear again now, except now, instead of imagining your life together and getting the butterflies or the excitement or that sense of yes, now you have this sense of desperate, oh no, I can see myself, I can see my life played out without them. If I live to be a thousand, I'll never get over them. And not only that, but now I'm going to have to imagine what it's like when they're with somebody else. Not only are they going to be with somebody else, I bet they're going to fall deeply, madly in love with that next person. And they're probably going to have 17 children and a white stallion and a castle with a picket fence. And they'll have fireworks to celebrate their love making every night. And I get to watch all that from a distance. It's not real. You're under a spell. The same spell that made you fall in love is now tormenting you. The limerence kicks in at the beginning and at the end, unless the decision is your choice. So just keep in mind what feels like reality isn't as real as it feels. They aren't as perfect as you're remembering them to be, and you're not as hopeless as it feels in that moment. Now, you might say, you don't understand. I really am in overwhelming pain. They really were amazing. I'm sure they were amazing, but they weren't as perfect as you remember them. You're not as hopeless, and you didn't cause it all, unless, you, you know, unless you're watching this and you need to be on the douchebag channel. Like, if you cheated on her with her best friend and her sister, then yeah, it's probably your fault. But most relationships end... And the person didn't actually cause it all. So if you're in that general, more breakup kind of scenario, this video is for you. Understand what you're going through. You have to remind yourself that you're not as lost, they're not as irreplaceable, and you're not as hopeless as it'll feel. You'll also paint the picture of the future way more darkly. And funny enough, the more intelligent you are, the more you're going to have a tendency to see it as a, a bit more pessimistically. In other words, intelligent people are problem solvers. Well, what's the key to problem solving? Anticipating problems. Good problem solvers and successful people are people that can anticipate problems before the problems devastate their plans and their companies. So if you're a highly intelligent, successful person, you're probably good at problem solving, which means you anticipate problems. When you're in this mindset, you look at the future and you reject happy thoughts. You reject the idea that 
the, the what should happen and the best positive outcome is going to happen. You'll anticipate the worst and plan for it. And it'll give you a sense of comfort. But don't trust that version of reality either. Your version of a dark reality is no more reliable than the idiot beside you just convincing himself of positive things all the time. So just kind of disconnect from either one of those and tell yourself the truth. You don't know what's going to happen. And it's okay that you don't know. Your heart and your mind are probably at war anyway. So tell your heart and your mind to take a deep breath and trust that no contact is the best way to build up your sense of resilience and independence and the ability to move on without them while simultaneously reminding them of your worth. So it's the best way to get them back. It's the best way to move on. While you're in that state, I, I do a video on this. There are a few things to do to kind of really help reset your mind when you're in that dark limerence. Now, it's going to be even harder. It's going to be even harder to do that if you're not just in that state of dark limerence, but there's another state and it's not in the DSM right now, but it's getting a lot of attention and it really applies to people that are ADHD, BPD, or again, those high end problem solvers that feel a compulsion to hyperanalyze. Some people, when they're in heartbreak, they'll kind of hyperanalyze on their emotion and they'll really convince themselves they'll beat themselves up and they fall further into a depression and this self-loathing, but they're not really hyperanalyzing the actual relationship. They're just kind of focused on the sadness. And that's a different issue. But what I'm talking about with rejection sensitive dysphoria is actually when you're kind of hyper fixated on not just the emotion, the emotion is definitely part of it, but you're also replaying every little detail. Not only replaying every little detail, but rejection sensitive dysphoria is when that part of your mind is the anterior cingulate gyrus that's responsible for topic change. And it makes it almost impossible for you to change the channel in your mind. Rejection sensitive dysphoria Dysphoria is Latin for the word unbearable or difficult to bear. What it means is that your emotional pain is so intense that it's really coming out as not just physical pain, but physical agony. And you're really having trouble getting relief. In other words, especially at night and in the morning, but pretty much all day as well. It's worse at night. It's worse in the morning. It's worse when you're driving and you have long extended periods with nothing to do. But with rejection sensitive dysphoria, even when you have something to do, you'll feel the weight of them in the back of your mind. And it feels, it feels like every second you're carrying like 800 pounds of weight in a backpack. The best way to say it is, it feels like you're bearing the unbearable. It feels like what you're living with is too painful to live with. So people might say, stay strong. And you're thinking, stay strong. I'm not strong. Or hang in there. You're like, I'm not hanging in there. I don't know how I'm still alive. I didn't think I could be alive and be in this much pain. If you're in rejection sensitive dysphoria, and it's more likely if you're ADHD or if you're borderline, you have a hyperfixation. Remember, ADHD isn't actually an attention deficiency as much as it's an attention dysregulation. Some things you will have a deficiency for. Other things you will have a hyper ability to hyper focus on. That's why if you're ADHD, you're probably creative. You're probably intense. You're probably intelligent. You probably have a bit of a temper. You're probably loyal. Whatever it is that you feel on a scale of one to 10, ADHD is kind of an intensifier of that emotion. So when you're in love, you're crazy in love. And maybe you're so in love, that's what generated the breakup. Maybe you convinced the other person that they were so perfect and so amazing and so out of your league that you accidentally convinced them of that. And maybe that's part of, reason, part of the reason why now they're broken up with you. Well, now that's just going to make the pain worse. And now you're going to hyperfixate even more. And with rejection sensitive dysphoria, it's like no matter what you're looking at or what you're doing, it's going to remind you of the person you lost. Like when I was going through it, she used to drive a white car. So I could go out on the street. First, it was if I saw a white car, it reminded me of her. It, can, it could even be a white Volkswagen or a white Trans Am or a white Lamborghini, whatever it was. If it was a white car, I'm thinking about her. And then I started realizing I'd look at a black car and say, oh, there's a black car. That doesn't make me think about her because it's not a white car. Oh, no, I am thinking about her. Now I'm thinking about her because it's a black car. Hey, look, there's a motorcycle. That's not a white car or a black car. Oh, no, I'm still thinking about it. I would turn on a cartoon. I turned on like a, The Simpsons, and there was a character with blonde hair, and I was like, blonde hair. Uh. So everything torments you when you're in that state of mind. Take a deep breath, and it's important to consistently realize that the pain you're feeling isn't evidence that she's irreplaceable or that he's irreplaceable or that it's hopeless or that you're broken and that you caused it. Take a deep breath and remember sometimes that intensity is evidence of the unusual level of drive and the unusual depth of feeling that you have. Look at it this way. When I was, when I was going through it and it felt, it really felt unbearable for me. I was in about three and a half months of no contact. I ended up reaching out to a good uh, friend of mine, a mentor of mine named Dr. Joe Bean. And he put me in contact with a couple of really good people. I was around Vanderbilt University at the time. One of them told me, 
Listen, Ken, if your if your pain on a scale of one to ten is is so exceptional, and you know it's not normal, it's not what you see, look around you, and you don't see other people going through heartbreak quite to this level of pain. Yeah, they might be home, you know, crying on their couch. They might have those weak moments, but they're not overwhelmed to the level that you are. Like there were a couple of times my sister caught me just laying on her kitchen floor crying, just broken, just overcome. And I could intellectually explain why it wasn't hopeless, but it still felt hopeless. And this person said to me, well, on a scale of one to 10, if your pain is a 57, if your pain is my, to me, my pain was infinity. Well, if you're capable of generating pain to that level, you're probably capable of being creative to an exceptional level. You probably have the ability to move people, inspire people. You probably have the ability to achieve things and to do things and to cause things, build things that the most average person that isn't capable of feeling that level of hurt probably can't generate. In other words, being gifted is both a curse and a gift. In the middle of a heartbreak, it's going to feel like a curse. But remind yourself, if you're capable of feeling overwhelming hurt to that level, you're probably capable of some amazing things. So take a deep breath. And trust that even though, just like you're seeing them as more perfect than they are, you're seeing yourself as more broken than you are. You're seeing your life without them as more hopeless than it is. Don't fight the feeling, but don't trust it. Feelings are very real. That doesn't make them true, and it doesn't make them trustworthy. So if you're in the middle of that rejection-sensitive dysphoria, it's like dark limerence on crack. It's like an extended version of what's already painful to the point that it feels almost unbearable. Now, there's another level to it, and it doesn't happen very often, but when you're in dark limerence or in rejection-sensitive dysphoria, it's going to feel like you might have this, and it's referred to as Takotsubo syndrome, otherwise known as heartbreak syndrome. It's actually when the level of pain that you're feeling is so severe that it's really started to have a physical manifestation. It's actually started to weaken the heart muscle. So you can actually feel pain. You know that pain I was talking about with rejection-sensitive dysphoria and dark limerence? It's like, it's like that emotional pain is so strong that it comes across as physical agony. Well, heartbreak syndrome is actually when it's actually impacted you physically. It's weakened the muscles of the heart. It's actually possible to die from a broken heart. Now, it's very, very rare, but it's just kind of the other end of the spectrum. And it's more evidence of what I'm saying. Not everybody feels things to the same level. So stop taking that overwhelming sense of agony that you're in as evidence that you're broken. As evidence that you did something. Look, maybe you did. Look, if you cheated on her, if you cheated on him, if they walk in and, and caught you like sleeping with a, you know, your next door neighbor and their father-in-law and the raccoon across the street, whatever it is, look, if you caused it, you caused it. But stop taking imperfections and stop taking normal human mistakes as evidence that you lost the love of your life. If your imperfections and if the things that you know you would forgive them for are the same things that they won't forgive you for, then stop convincing yourself that you ruined the greatest love story of all time. The greatest love story of all time would be able to endure, forgive, and move on from just normal imperfections and mistakes. Now, if what you did was manipulation, cruelty, and toxic, then yeah, you kind of earned your heartbreak, and maybe this video isn't for you, but maybe it is. Because if you caused it, then you might still be in one of these severe levels of pain that I'm talking about. So what I'm just trying to tell you is that not every heartbreak is the same, don't trust what the pain tells you, but don't fight off the pain. When you try to fight off that pain and shake it off, and especially guys, we used to be raised in this, the generations before now, we were taught to shake off pain, to walk it off, to rub some dirt on it. And there's a lot of people now that are so afraid of being simps or so afraid of being easily emotionally manipulated that we're kind of turning ourselves into intentional narcissistic, not good guys. The guys today, a lot of times, are so afraid of being a simp that they take that pain and they just try to deny it. Like, I don't need a woman. Somebody's going to do that to me. I don't need her. They might call her name or talk, to, talk about her like she's property or talk about women like they're not worthy of love and respect. And they are. It's just that some guys are so afraid of being wounded and being seen as emotionally weak that they kind of voluntarily go through a douchebag transformation process. Don't do that. Take the pain as evidence that you maybe you're exceptional. Maybe when you say you're in love, you mean it. And stop taking that pain as something you need to shake off. What if the relationship you lost was worthy of mourning? What if you're the kind of person that actually has the character, that has the integrity, that has the authenticity, and that has the strength to be really strong, sacrificial, um, consistent, loyal, loving, long-suffering person? Maybe you're in pain because you actually meant the words you said. Maybe you're beating yourself up and feeling shame and feeling weak and feeling lost because the person who broke up with you seems strong. 
Well, why are they strong? Because they've been with two or three other people. In other words, we look at the person who's not in pain and we associate ourselves as weak and they're strong. Why are they strong? Because they moved on. They're with somebody else. Or, hey, they've been with three other people. I keep seeing their social media and they're thriving. Meanwhile, I have trouble just kind of pulling myself off the couch and dragging myself off the porch and going to work. So I just kind of lay there at my desk and wait for somebody to tell me I'm not doing my job. In other words, you feel paralyzed. They seem to be thriving. So they're strong and you're weak. No, maybe they're douchebag. Maybe you're authentic. Maybe they're self-absorbed and maybe you have integrity. Maybe they're acting like a three-year-old who just got a favorite toy and they forgot about the other one that they used to love. Maybe they're shallow, immature, juvenile, and all wrapped up in themselves. And maybe they live with that kind of strength and confidence because they know somewhere you're wanting another chance. So they're still living off the ego boost of knowing that you're in love with them and would do anything to get them back. That doesn't make you weak. That doesn't make you the lesser one. Sometimes it means the person that has the strongest heart, the best mind, the most authenticity, and the most integrity is going to hurt the most. So stop beating yourself up for hurting, but just kind of understand what you're going through. So some of the things that you can do if you're in dark limerence, if you're in rejection-sensitive dysphoria, or if you're in that heartbreak syndrome. Uh, Dr. Daniel Emmon has done a lot of work on what I'm talking about. Um, he really kind of dives into it deep as far as the anterior cingulate gyrus and hyperfocus on somebody that you're in love with. Uh, rejection, sensitivity, dysphoria. There's a lot of information out there about that. Um, Dr. Romani is very good. I'm, I'm not trying to hide other people that have really good content out there. So check those people out. There's some really good things out there about what I'm talking about. But in the meantime, some of the things you can do to help get over it. Keep a consistent list of the things about them. The imperfections, the inconsiderations, the ways that they hurt you, the things that they did to you that you know you would never do to anybody. Make an exhaustive list and remind yourself of who they are. Because when you're in one of these states of mind, you're going to see them as perfect. If you're, if you're borderline, you're even going to idealize them, hyper, hyper idealize them. They'll not only seem perfect, but they'll seem like the only perfect person for you. If you're ADHD, you're going to hyper fixate on them. In other words, it's very similar to that. You're just going to, you're going to have a really almost impossible time getting your mind to change the channel and feeling like that you're, there's even hope. Like somebody will tell you that you can get somebody else and you'll say, I know I can get somebody else, but I don't care. I'll never want anybody else. So if you're dealing with another disorder, it's just going to kind of magnify the pain of what I'm talking about. So it's even more important. Keep a detailed list and add to it as you think of things. Remind yourself on a consistent basis of their imperfection. It doesn't mean that you don't want them back. A lot of times people are afraid if I let in enough of the negative that I'm going to decide I don't want them. And I don't want to decide that because I want them. So don't go for that. Don't, don't give into that mindset. It's a lot like saying, well, I would like broccoli if I sprinkled some salt on it. But if I sprinkled salt on it, then I would like it and I would eat it. And I don't want to do that because I hate it. So it's like this self-fulfilling, fearful prophecy. So remind yourself, if you want to win them back or if you want to get over them, either way, the best thing to do is remind yourself of their flaws. Pull them out of that hyper idealized state. Pull them out of that, that state where you're hyper fixating on them. And on this, at the same time, write down the exceptional things about you. Even if you feel like the biggest, dumbest, most worthless waste of space in the world, right? There are things about you that are exceptional. Write down those things because just like you need to remind yourself of how imperfect they are, to help restore your sense of reality and help make that overwhelming agony just a little bit easier to live with, you also need to remind yourself of your worth outside of them. If you've kind of made your entire future based on, on happiness, depending on if you can be with them, then they've become your happiness. If they've become your happiness, they've become your idol. It's really hard to fall in love with somebody that's worshiping you. And it's really hard to maintain a sense of strength if you've convinced yourself that you can't be happy without them. Now you're not just chasing a person, you're chasing your only hope. That creates desperation. That creates clinginess. That creates this inability to stand up for yourself and healthy boundaries. All of those things make it impossible for them to be attracted to you long term. So if you want to keep them, remind yourself of your worth without them. Remind yourself of their imperfections without you. Stop thinking that the person they're going to end up with next is going to be that person that they're going to have the castle with the picket fence and sex and fireworks every night. It's not going to happen. Whatever flaws they had with you, they're going to carry over into the next relationship. Remind yourself of that. So give yourself permission. Don't fight the feeling that you have. Don't let it cause you to hyperanalyze and go back to another plan. That's another thing people do. They'll think, well, if I put enough attention on this, if I get enough 
coaching calls. If I get enough books and articles and watch enough videos to understand the breakup, then I can come up with a master plan. If I come up with the best kind of plan, if I have enough information, if I enough, if I have enough understanding, if I watch enough videos, read enough articles, have enough coaching calls, then I'll come up with the best plan to win this person back. Give me time, give me a goal, and give me enough information, I'll come up with the best strategy. It doesn't work. You're going to hyper fixate on something to the point that it's going to wear you down first emotionally, then mentally, and then physically. And then you're going to do something that's just a Hail Mary attempt to get them back. Or you'll write them a five page letter, or you'll come up with some kind of a fake excuse to reach out that's going to be very transparent. It's not going to work. And then you're going to beat yourself up for it. So take a deep breath. Don't fight those feelings of anxiety and fear, but don't trust them. And don't let them pull you back into another, let me come up with a master plan session. Your master plan sessions will wear you out. Understand this, the best first step to a real master plan is letting no contact work. Finding some other purpose, passion, or plan for your life that not only reminds them that you're capable of living without them, that not only reminds them of how exceptional and what you're capable of creating and generating, but also more importantly reminds you. So when they do come back, it's really a choice if you want to go back. It's not a desperation. If it's a desperation, it's not going to be attractive and it's not going to hold for very long anyway. So have a purpose, have a passion, have a plan that you can kind of put all that energy into. And while you're working on that, don't do it as a way to distract yourself from the person you lost. Do it knowing that the, that person in that hurt, that anxiety and that missing with them is actually going to be right there with you. So in other words, if you think I'm going to start a workout plan, don't start the workout plan thinking that it's going to be a distraction and it'll help you not think about them. It won't work. Start the new workout plan knowing that you're going to be thinking about them while you're working out. If you're going to start writing a book, writing an article, starting a business, whatever it is, just agree that the pain of missing that person is going to be sitting right here on your shoulder or it might be right in the middle of your heart or it may, might be right in that gut punch that you still feel in the knot in your stomach. It's okay. Just agree to carry it with you, to take it with you. But as you agree to carry it with you, you're not wasting energy fighting it off. And when you're trying to fight it off and failing, the fact that you can't stop thinking about them is going to make you feel like an even more failure. And it's going to make you a little bit sadder. So stop fighting it. Take it as evidence that you're exceptional and that when you fall in love, you mean it. Stop beating yourself up for it. Another thing, have at least one person that you can share your feelings with. Don't let yourself hear your own voice. Tell everybody around you that you love them, that you're praying to get them back, that you just want one more chance, that this shouldn't be happening. The more you hear yourself say it, the more you believe it. Have at least one friend that you can actually kind of like, you know, you know, bear your soul to. You can tell that person. I had one, one friend that I would go to and pour my heart out. I'd go over there on like a Wednesday and a Thursday. We'd watch like certain shows, have dinner, just hang out. And at some point in the evening, I'd tell him how much pain I was in. Tell him how much I was thinking about it and how much hurt I was in. And he would just tell me, hey, I understand. Hey, it's okay. You've always felt things deeply. You don't know what's over. I'm not going to tell you she's coming back. I'm not going to tell you that she will. I'm not going to tell you that she won't. I don't know. Give yourself the benefit of not knowing. There are going to be comments where, below where people are saying, you shouldn't want somebody back. Don't ever take somebody back. They're not going to come back. Well, the truth is, you don't know if they're going to come back. I can't promise you they will. You can't promise me that they won't. So just kind of give yourself permission to hope. And give yourself permission to not decide if you're going to go back to the relationship until they come back. Some of you are watching this right now and you know you want them back. That's okay. But your mind is going to pessimistically, especially if you're intelligent, especially if you're driven, you're going to assume that they won't come back. Give yourself permission not to know. Give yourself that one person that you can communicate with so you don't feel like you're denying it and hiding it. But to everybody else, to overlapping friends, um, to people that might be reporting, to what you're showing online, Show and project resilience, willingness to move on. What's really underrated is showing the ability to just stay engaged in life. Don't get a party bus. Don't act like you're having the best time of your life. I'm not saying that. You don't have to be a fraud or a fake, but just showing that you're capable of living your already intriguing life. That there are things about your life that you enjoy. There are things about you that you're proud of, that you enjoy having be true about you. Showing that kind of strength and confidence about yourself is highly underrated and highly attractive. And it's an, it's an effective trigger to make them stop and wonder if they made a mistake. So give yourself permission to hurt. Don't try to fight it. Find a passion. Find a plan. Find a project that you can start to build to remind them of what you're capable of. To remind yourself of what you're capable of. But don't do it as a way to try to distract yourself from them because it won't work. Have one person that you can just kind of share your truth with. And give yourself permission to hurt later. A weird thing that can work. Let's say you're in overwhelming pain when you wake up in the morning. 
Well, tell yourself when you wake up, all right, this evening from 5 to 6.30, I'm going to be on my couch with a blanket, shaking in pain, shaking with fear that I've lost them forever and not knowing if I'm ever going to get them back. I'm just giving myself permission to hurt to an overwhelming degree for an hour and a half later today. And as weird as it sounds, giving yourself that permission would give you just a little bit more functionality in your day. Uh, for me, it was like, okay, I might end up on my, my sister's kitchen floor in overwhelming agony. That was like from my personal playbook. I found myself in that position a couple of times years and years ago. So I know what it's like. Give yourself permission to hurt. Don't put it off. Just kind of schedule it. As, tra as crazy as that sounds, it can work. Also changing your diet, especially if you're ADHD or borderline or you really kind of deal with being hypersensitive. Actually, your diet can impact that. A lot of times more natural fats like a carnivore or a low carb diet can help. Like me personally, and it varies from person to person. Me, I love pancakes. I love pastries. I mean, you can tell I'm, I'm overweight, right? Well, if I have a stack of pancakes, I'm probably going to be in like a, a drooling pool of, you know, human depression laying on my couch watching Justified reruns, trying to remember what the meaning of life is all about for the next three hours. If you're already in a state of depression, having something like sugar or something that's a comfort food might actually be making your pain worse. There are also some supplements you can take. So none of what I'm telling you is going to resolve all that pain, but I'm trying to give you little increments that will make that, that functionality a little bit greater and make that overwhelming pain just a little bit less. You take as many things together as you can, and maybe it's 1% to 3% better. Well, you add all those up together, and you've got, you've got a real difference that can really help while you're in that no contact or trying to deal with that pain. One of the things I do as a relationship coach is kind of help people get set up and know how they can just start living on a more functional plan day to day. It's not a complete resolution of the pain, but it's just you kind of learn your own structure. You kind of learn mental and emotional and day-to-day -day structure so that you can get through the no contact. Find something that you can do to improve yourself so that you're becoming the greater version of you. It's like the you 2.0. So when they do look back, or even if they never look back, you've kind of outgrown them. You've kind of become the better version of yourself. So even if they came back, maybe you don't want them. But that's part of what I do in relationship coaching. So if I can be of help, please let me know. Give me a like, a comment, or a subscribe, and let me know if I need to clarify anything.